So, uh, before we start, I have to make a very raw confession. And that confession is that I'm a salesperson. <laughs> and I know a lot of you are looking at me and thinking to yourself, uh, that poor guy probably should have taken more math classes. You wouldn't have to be a salesperson, right? And so, that's the point that I want to get across today. Uh, the point today that's important for you to leave with is that the sales profession has been casted over the years in a negative light. We've been anchored to believe that salespeople, starting with the Arthur Miller Death of a Salesman novel about the salesperson is the woeful Willie Loman. Or later on, it's the, it's the calloused condo salesperson who's getting people to sign contracts that they don't want to sign. Or it's the cold-blooded broker that's uh, selling stock in a boiler room. And so it's my belief that these days are, are over, these days are gone. The sales profession has fundamentally changed. And so I think some of you might say, well, it's your belief. You also look like the kind of person that may have believed in Santa Claus before too. So how do you get to this belief? How do we know that this, this fact is true? And so as I was thinking through this analysis, I started with my own career as, a, as sort of the, the beginning Petri dish for this grand experiment, this thought process of where do I get this belief? And so my own career started as a publishing rep. And what that means is I sold textbooks to university professors. And this is back in the mid to late 90s. And we were trained to sell in a very specific way. What we would do is send a textbook to a professor that we knew was going to be selling a class. We'd send that book about a week or two ahead of when we, we knew they were, that we were going to be on campus at that particular university. And then when we got to the professor's office during their office hours, the good news is that the professors were always available because students were never, never around during office hours. So we knew we had their undivided attention. And so what we'd do is we'd walk over to the bookshelf and we'd find the book that we had sent to them because the professor had always unwrapped it and put it right on the shelf without ever looking at it. So we'd take the book down and we'd open it and we'd ask the professor, hey, what's the most important piece of this class for you? Or what's your most, uh, your most difficult topic for students to grasp? And they would tell us and we'd flip to that part of the book and we'd say, well, let's take a look together at how this particular author covers this topic, and we'd have a little bit of a conversation, and if there was a pretty good match, chances are we'd get a sale. It was pretty simple. But then something happened. Technology in the classroom happened. And all of a sudden, as publishers, we started adding CD-ROMs and what we called companion websites. Now, back in the late 90s, a companion website meant that we would have multiple choice questions that were self-graded, and after they were graded, they could email them to the professors. Like, ooh. Pretty, pretty snazzy stuff, right? You're like not an exactly iPad app sort of things. But in the late 90s, this was pretty cool stuff. And this started to broaden the breadth of information that we needed to know as salespeople in order to sell that particular product. And as I moved along in my career, my next step was working with a, an online economics education software company. That's when I moved out to Silicon Valley. And this was a big risk for, as a company, because now it's early 2000s. And even, now, even then, in the early 2000s, this concept of being an online product was still pretty new. And it turns out that the sale itself, while the product was built online, I discovered that there was a whole other layer of complexity to the sale with a product that was technology based. And that layer of technology, or that layer of complexity, is the IT manager at local universities. And so because we built the product in Flash, we had to get the IT manager to open up the firewalls and, and download Flash so that in the computer labs, the professors could use this product with their course. So it wasn't just about the product. It was about the implementation of the product that became just as important as the content in the product itself. And so now, working in the housing market, we sell data and analytics to a lot of the big banks and investment funds that are focused on the real estate and mortgage portfolios. And so this is where I came across, I guess what you call a bit of a realization. As I was going through my thought process, it occurred to me that the breadth of information that I now needed to know became even greater. So last week, I had an 82-minute sales call with one client. And so in 82 minutes, and I wrote this down because it's a lot of information, we started off talking about housing policy. And housing policy, the topics that we covered included Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, FH, FHFA, HUD, Ariota Rental, Deed and Lou, Cash for Keys, Deed for Lease, Neighborhood Stabilization Program, Community Reinvestment Act, Camp and Harp. 
That was the first 10 or 15 minutes of the conversation. And that customer, who I'd never talked to before, expected me to know something about all of those things. Whew. Now he, now he trusts me. He knows that I know what I'm talking about with regard to the housing market. So the next part of the conversation was about the investment vehicles. What could he possibly invest in when we're talking about the housing market? So then we covered residential mortgage-backed securities, non-performing loans, sub-performing loans, pre-foreclosure, foreclosure, REOs, and mortgage servicing rights. <laughs> Easy stuff. <laughs> then if we're going to have him investing in these vehicles, how do we value the security so he knows that he's buying and selling these at the right price? So... The conversation then turns to pricing the trade. And pricing the trade, we talked about net present value, loss severity, stress testing, loan to value ratios, broker price opinions, automated valuation monitor, debentures, <laughs> governments, interest payments, prepayment rates, default rates, and credit enhancements. Whew. Now we're making progress. The next stage of the sale was, okay, now we're pricing the trade. What models, what numbers, what financial engineering do we do to get to those numbers? And that's when we covered modeling concepts like multivariate regression, leaks, angle regression, bootstrapping, feature selection, regression trees, machine learning, and let's not forget OSCOM's razor. <laughs> Finally, the last piece of the conversation talked about the technical implementation of the product. If he was thinking about buying my product, what sort of technical implementation hurdles would there be? And that's where we covered FTP, SFTP, API, CSV, and SQL. All we did was talk in letters. We didn't talk actually in, in words. <laughs> we just talked about letters. And somehow this all made sense in an alphabet suit. All this happened in 82 minutes, and it happened in the initial sales call with this person that's going to take at least three to four more months before we think about reaching a contract stage of the transaction. And after this initial conversation, I'm then going to have to sell first to the initial trader. Then I'm going to proceed with a sales process with the rest of the team. Then I've got to go talk to the portfolio manager. Then I've got to get the data IT, data analyst person on board. And lest we forget the legal mumbo jumbo that goes with the actual contract negotiation. And this is when it started to occur to me, it started to occur to me that selling is not about telling your story or pitching. Selling is about getting the customer to tell you their story. And the sale is about building that framework building that house in which they pour their story and their content to you so that you can identify where there's a possible need for your product or for your solution. And so if we think about how that sales call or that salesperson has changed over time, it used to be just a sales representative. And then we have business development people. And then we have account managers. These are all the names of different ways that we like to call a salesperson. And then there's client managers. Then there's now sales engineers. Then there's the technical salesperson. There's a field engineer, a solution specialist, a pre-sales engineer, a forward deployment engineer, and even some salespeople go by the title of chief operating officer, which is what I do. And so then I thought, OK, I think I've kind of proven this out in my little petri dish of, petri dish of my own career. Let me take this a little wider. Let me find other ways I can experiment with this, this belief that the sales profession has changed. So I started off at LinkedIn, and I just logged into my LinkedIn account, and I typed in sales representative for open jobs, and I came up with about 2,700 results, 2,763 results. Then I typed in sales engineer. I got 2,500 results. So there's almost as many sales engineer jobs as there are sales representative jobs. So then I thought, well, maybe this concept of sales engineer has always been here, and I just missed it. So I did what every logical person would do. I went to the one best source for information. I went to Google. And Google's got this cool little tool called Google Trends where you can find keywords, put in keywords, and then it'll tell you when that keyword became a significant search term. And so starting at the beginning of the world, which in Google world is about 2005, the top line represents sales representative. So as a search term, sales representative has always been around. It's always been a part of Google's search terminology. But the second line, sales engineer, it turns out this was not yet a significant search term until 2008. And the concept of field engineer did not become a significant search term in Google until 2010. Now, I'm sure these concepts were around, but they were not part of the regular business vernacular prior to the last five or 10 years even. And so finally, I thought, OK, I've got this petri dish of my own career, and I've expanded it out and experimented in some other places. How do I apply this in context of a greater market? Does this theory, this belief hold in terms of the whole marketplace? 
And so I built a very simple model thinking about the importance or the, in the bottom axis, the contribution of a salesperson to a sale. And on the vertical axis, how much customization or specialization is there related to the product or service? So let's just start throwing a couple of companies in here just to see where they might fall in this very simple model. So in the very bottom, and I know some in the back might not be able to see this, but in the very bottom, I just put up a logo for Evernote. So Evernote's a cool little note-taking software application. And so Evernote's interesting because you have two options, and only two options. You can download the free version, or you can go premium and pay a few bucks, and then you get a, a bigger memory bank and other stuff you can do. But that's it. They don't have salespeople. Go to their jobs page, their career page on Evernote.com. There is not a single salesperson opening there. They expect that you walk in, buy the product, or not. And it's a lot like the second company here, Microsoft. Microsoft is, you know, you've got Windows, a couple different versions. You've got Office, a couple different versions. But you're not going to get a phone call from a Microsoft sales rep in Redmond, Washington, saying, hey, would you like to upgrade to the latest version of Microsoft Office? They sort of expect that you're going to walk in, buy it, or not. And that reminded me a lot of McDonald's. McDonald's is like that. You walk in, you've got a preset menu, you tell the cashier what you want, they ask if you want fries with that. Thank you very much, please step aside. Your order will be out in just a moment. That's how these companies operate. So there's no contribution of the salesperson, but yet the product is not very customizable either. So that transaction is very simple. So we start to make this a little bit more complex and think about very customized products or specialized products. If we look at the very top here, we've got Dell. So back in the 90s, Michael Dell was, was famous for creating this customized computer. You can create a computer exactly to your specifications and it would show up at your door. Not a very novel concept now, 20 years later, but back in the 90s, this is pretty heady stuff. And today, Google does pretty much the same thing. You can go online, set up a Google business account, it gives you Gmail, it gives you Google Docs, it gives you their analytics platform to do your search engine optimization, uh, all of your marketing. Very customizable but you also never get a phone call from a Google sales rep. In fact, if you have a problem with their service, tough luck. They don't even have customer service people. You've all experienced this, apparently. So let's look at the other end of the spectrum. What about places where the contribution of the salesperson is very great, but customization is small? So I just put an Apple logo up there. Now, Apple is interesting in context of today because you can still customize your computer, but that's not their selling proposition. That was a selling proposition for Dell. They wanted you to buy online and not talk to the salespeople. Now Apple wants you to in their store because they know that their salespeople have deep domain expertise and that customer buying experience is a key part of their brand. It's part of that relationship you have with that product. So the person, the contribution of the, of the salesperson becomes immense for that Apple brand. And that reminded me of Starbucks. Pretty much the same. You can get a Frappuccino or an espresso. It's sort of customized, but not really but it's the customer experience. It's the barista behind the bar who remembers that you come in every day and you always order a double mocha app, frappuccino or whatever you order. Right? That's pretty cool. That's the experience. And so if we start filling in in the middle, a couple of enterprise software companies, one is Salesforce. So Salesforce is a CRM company. And at Salesforce, I can go set up a few licenses for all of my sales team at my company. And then and only then afterwards do I get a, co a phone call from an account manager. So the account manager is assigned after I become a customer. So the contribution of the salesperson is pretty small when it comes to the transaction. But the reason that business people are willing to tolerate that is because there's such flexibility and such customization with their back-end platform. I can do all kinds of stuff with my enterprise if I'm built into Salesforce. Amazon does the same thing. Now, I'm not talking about the Amazon where you can go buy books and lawn furniture. I'm talking about the Amazon that does enterprise server enterprise server services. So anyone in this room today, right now, could leave here and set up an Amazon EC2 cluster account and then kick off and fire off as many servers as you need in order to do the computations that you need, all without talking to a salesperson. You can basically stack up 50 servers if you need it right now in the next five minutes. Never hear from a salesperson. In fact, the only time we ever heard from a sales rep at Amazon was when we kicked off a huge data cluster calculation batch from Altos, and they actually called us and said, um, next time, could you let us know ahead of time? Because we were kind of reserving that server space for somebody else. We didn't know you were going to need so much, so just kind of let us know. So they were actually asking us to throttle back, not exactly a salesperson. <laughs> so let's take the extreme case, where there's high contribution of the salesperson and high customization of the product. And I think that's where mostly you see big enterprise 
software and hardware companies like Cisco and Oracle. That's where the salesperson is required to have very, very deep domain expertise. And that's where they bring in sales engineers and field engineers. Or that's where that person is all the same because the sales process is very long. It's 6, 12, 24. I've talked to people in Oracle. It's a 36-month sales cycle. And it's all part of showing your technical expertise so that you understand what their story is. You need to understand their product, their market, their users, how all of this, all, all of the Oracle product fits. And what's interesting is Microsoft has done the same thing in the last five to 10 years. They've sort of moved upstream where they've got these enterprise solutions. And meanwhile, Oracle and Cisco have actually moved downstream because they see value in the scale of the sale. If they can sell you product without salespeople getting involved and do so in a much shorter timeline, that's a great little cash cow for them. So what falls in the middle? What I think falls in the middle right now are some of the services industries, whether it's real estate or insurance or financial, where you see some contribution to the salesperson. You probably know your real estate agent fairly well. You may know your insurance agent. You may know your banker if you need to go get a mortgage. There's some customization in the product, but at the end of the day, if you need a mortgage, it's pretty set of what your two or three options might be. And more so, I think that these middle these middle of the road services are actually getting pulled down. These, com these companies want you to be able to specialize without getting a sales rep involved because those salespeople can be very expensive. So let's do a couple more. So one is the auto industry. It's sort of an old stodgy in industry and Fiat more recently has come out with this no commission program. <coughs> so the salespeople are not commissioned on the sale and the idea is to relieve some of that stress from the people when they're buying an automobile. <coughs> And so there's some customization. You can choose your color. You can choose if you want power windows and locks. But ultimately, there's not a lot of customization. And the salesperson's a little bit involved, but not much. And then take some of the old world car companies like Ford and Chevy. I think you might argue that the salesperson has a negative consequence <laughs> on the contribution to the sale. People don't want to deal with the traditional salesperson. And finally, some of the big old industrial heavy industry companies, Boeing, General Electric, DuPont, They've all got these very, very big, heavy, long sales processes. So Boeing, for example, Southwest Airlines in December bought 150 737s from Boeing. Big news, big headlines. I doubt highly that the Boeing sales rep cold called to the CEO of Southwest and said, hey, I got great news and I got a deal for you. We just built 150 brand new 737s. We got a money back guarantee. Why don't you just give it a try for the next 60 days? <laughs> That's not how the sale works in this case, right? So the sales cycle is so long, and that person needs to be an aerospace engineer expert almost in order to understand where Southwest needs to be with the comfort of their uh, passengers, being able to meet some of the guidelines of the FAA. All these other pieces are parts of the, of the sale. And so as I wrap up, and I feel like I'm starting to now prove this theory that, hey, the salesperson role it really has changed in the last five or 10 years. And why is that? Because I think we're seeing a convergence because of a divergence. What do I mean by that? The convergence is the amount of information and what type of information is required, the knowledge base of the salesperson. It's converging, not just being able to talk with a quick wit, but it's being able to talk intelligently to build that framework to get the customer to tell their story so you can solve their problems. There's this convergence of information that's necessary for the salesperson to be successful. And it's also a divergence because we're seeing they want to be able to sell a ton of product without ever a salesperson getting involved, or they want it to be highly customizable so that the sales rep becomes a key part, a key collaborator with the customer so that they're so intertwined that the idea of separating the two is, is moot. They don't want to do it. So there's a convergence in the amount of information because of the divergence in the way that these companies are doing business. So does that mean it's revenge of the nerds? Does that mean all the engineers in this room are going, sales dudes finally got to get a clue. It's about time, right? I don't think so. I think it's, it's actually the opposite. I prayed to the technology god of Steve Jobs, and he gave me the answer. His quote is, just to read it for the people in the back, You've got to start with the customer experience and work backward toward the technology, not the other way around. And so as salespeople, yes, we need to know more. But what's interesting for the engineers is that the salespeople are starting to kind of encroach into that hallowed ground of technical expertise. So maybe some of those engineers aren't quite needed anymore, except in those places where 
the engineer becomes a pivotal part of the sale. Because there are plenty of places, like that sale I mentioned that's going to be three or four months from now, there's places where I'm going to have my data engineer on a sales call with the portfolio manager to give him solace that, hey, the service is going to be good, here's how we're going to perform. I'm going to have my CTO on the phone with their CTO to make sure that we're collaborating correctly. And so we need the engineers to be part of the sales process. We need them to come forward and be able to communicate with the customers as a team. And so the next time somebody says to you, uh, yeah, I'm in sales, you're at a cocktail party, what you should think of them is not the Willie Loman or the fast talker. This is what you should think of, of the salesperson today. Thank you.